God calls out this man Abraham. Abraham is going to respond by faith, as we'll see. Abraham, according to the promise of God, will have a son. His son is named, anyone know? Isaac. Isaac. That's the son of promise. He has another notable son. Anyone remember what that son's name was? Ishmael. Ishmael. And this difference between Ishmael and Isaac will be very significant as we go through Scripture. We'll find that often mentioned, and we're going to turn to the book of Romans and the book of Galatians in, in just a moment, and see this distinction between that which comes from Isaac and that which comes from Ishmael. Both of them are a physical seed. And yet in Isaac is going to be found the promise given of a spiritual seed. And so that's how God lays this thing out like that in kind of, a, a, you know, kind of two ways. We have physical seed, uh, Ishmael and Isaac, and then from Isaac there's going to be a spiritual seed. And that's very significant as we'll see as we go through. But the history is, in brief, Abraham, the father of the Hebrew nation, has a son of promise by the name of Isaac. Isaac has a notable son. His name is Jacob. Jacob. I'm going to turn over here for now. <laughs> Jacob. His name is Jacob. And, <laughs> no, and Esau, yeah. But, but Jacob, so it's, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those three notable, notable uh, individuals. And Jacob has a name change along the way, which we'll see as we go through. Jacob is given a new name. He's given the name of Israel, Israel, and from Israel, we're going to see that there are 12 tribes of Israel, and the Lord is going to pull out one tribe, Judah, from which the lion of the tribe of Judah would come, fulfilling these, this promise here given to the people of, or to given here to Abraham. So there would be, there would be then uh, a Jacob, Israel, remember Israel would go down into um, Egypt, and spend 400 years in bondage. This is what's in your Bible. 400 years of bondage. And then he begins to deliver them in the book of Exodus. And as Exodus for 40 years, there's a 40 year wandering where God miraculously takes care of his people. And then we have the law given to them in Exodus chapter 20. The law is another covenant. But it's different than this, this covenant. The law is given to them in Exodus chapter 20. Um, and then we see coming forth from the law the ministry of Moses. Remember Moses, very important figure in Scripture. And then we see the ministry of a man named Joshua. Joshua would succeed um, Moses. Joshua would lead the people into this land which God promised them here in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And so we see this, the ministry of Joshua. And then after Joshua, we see the reign of certain judges who would come. You've heard of Samson. You know, everybody's heard of Samson in... What was the name? Delilah, Samson and Delilah. But, but would come the ministry of the judges, and the judges would deliver Israel as they would backslide from God and go and, 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 and follow after uh, uh, strange gods, etc. Then God would judge his people, and he would bring a judge to judge those who are, who are coming against Israel, and he'd bring Israel back into the fold, if you will. And after the ministry of the judges, the, the Israelites, they cry for a king, and they want a king. And so God says, okay, I'll give you a king. You don't want me? I'll give you a king. And the king that he gives them is a man by the name of Saul. And Saul reigns for 40 years over unified Israel. And after Saul, then God gives them a king after his own heart, and his name is King David. And David also rules for 40 years over the unified Israel. And during that time of rule, there's another covenant which is established. I have a purpose for going through this history here with you. There is another covenant which is established, which is called the Davidic covenant. God makes certain promises to David. He doesn't do away with these promises, though. That's the important thing of Genesis chapter 12. He adds to them, and he says, Now, David, you're going to have a son who's going to reign forever on your throne in Jerusalem. And you read about that in the Gospel of Luke. And Jesus comes to rule and reign on that, that throne in Jerusalem. But something happens, and we know we are now in this thing called the church age for the last 2,000 years, and we don't have time to go back and discuss that right now. So there is going to be these, the reigns of the kings. And after David, there's Solomon. Solomon reigns 40 years over unified Israel. And then all of a sudden, there's a split after the death of Solomon. 
and there's a northern tribe, and there's southern tribes, uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and then, they, and then the, the, um, the tribes go into apostasy, and God, as he forewarned them, said, I'm going to send you into captivities, and he sends them into Assyria, the, the northern tribes and the southern tribes into Babylon. And then he says, though, he says earlier on, he said, but I will regather you from that. I'll regather you from that. And we find, we read about the regathering in the books of Ezra, yeah. Nehemiah, those books. Okay, God's beginning to regather the people. But he also said in the book of Deuteronomy and other places, and actually we looked at this once upon a time, that there would be now a worldwide dispersion. This is all prophecy God gave before. And he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to send you into a worldwide dispersion. And that happened in 70 A.D. But he also said to his Jewish people, fulfilling this covenant, which has not been yet completely fulfilled, but with this in mind, this promise that he made, he said, but that worldwide dispersion that began in 70 AD called the Diaspora, I think it's called, something like that. He said, but I'll regather you in the latter days. And what will I do? I'll bring you into that land here that I told you about in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And that's exactly what God did in 1948. He began to regather the people of Israel into the land. Amen. But he also said in Ezekiel, I think it's 37, in Ezekiel 37, I talked about this briefly last week, he said, but when I regather you, you're gonna, when I take your dry bones, dry bones, they've been, they've been dead and laying waste. When I take these dry bones, he said, you'll, you'll, there'll be life in them, but there won't be any breath in them. And life is maybe not the right term. They'll come to life in some manner, but not with, not with a spirit filled. And that's where the Jews are today. They're in the land, so they've been rebirthed as a nation, but they have no spirit of God in them yet. That was yet to come. Turn over to Romans chapter number 11 with me. And Romans chapter number 11, and this is all working towards helping us to get some better perspective or more deep perspective on this little covenant given in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And the reason I spend so much time on it is because in here we'll see Christ from this. And the reason I spend so much time in it is because there is a number of people who have said the church has replaced the promises given to Israel. The church has not replaced the promises given to Israel, not according to God's word. And if we look at Romans chapter 11, so now this is, this is years uh, after those things that we just got done talking about, but obviously before 1948, um, God says in verse number, let's see, where do I want to start? Um, probably in verse number one for a second, and then we're going to jump to the end of it. Uh, I say then, hath God cast away his people, meaning Israel, that's what he's talking about, and Paul says through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, God forbid... In other words, no, he hasn't cast them away. For I, am, uh, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. There he goes to the physical seed. See, this is not the spiritual seed he's talking about now, which we will describe. He's saying, look, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, going back to the physical seed. And he's saying God is not through with the physical seed of Israel. That's what he's saying here. He said, God hath, hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. And, then, and now, let's, now let's jump over to verse number, uh, verse number 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. And we're going to describe that later. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Watch this. That blindness in part is happened to Israel. And that's where they live today. Today, the people of Israel are in a state of spiritual blindness. They've been brought back together, as Ezekiel said, those dry bones have risen, but there's no spirit in them yet. They're still in unbelief. But watch this. He says that's how they are today in blindness until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now what is that? What God says is, when I'm done dealing with the Gentile people during this church age, because remember, the church is primarily a Gentile thing. It was not designed to be such. In the beginning of the church were mostly Jewish people. But then at some point in the book of Acts, Paul said, Lo, I turned to the Gentiles because you've rejected Christ again. I return to the Gentiles and I'm going to move out to the Gentiles. And so when the fullness of the Gentiles become in, that is when the church is complete, 
mostly Gentiles, though not exclusively, because whosoever will may come. But when the church is complete, and I take the church out of the way, verse number 26, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So this is the history and the prophecy of Israel. One day their sins will be taken away. Who? Those who come, and we looked at this last week, those who come to, the Israel, to God by faith after the tribulation, they recognize their Messiah and say, My Lord and my God. And God says, I will save them. And he will then restore them to their proper place as the head of the nations ruling from Israel in some manner with Christ on the throne. So now that's their history. So how does the church fit in on any of this? Where do we get in on any of this? Because if you notice back in Genesis 12, don't turn there because we're going to look at Romans again. In Genesis chapter 12, he said, well, the promise I'm making is, yeah, you'll have a seed. It'll be a physical seed. And yes, I'm going to give you a land. It's going to be a physical land. But he said, but all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. How do we get blessed? How do all the families of the earth get blessed? That has to do then with not so much the physical seed, but what's going to come forth in the spiritual seed. Look at Romans chapter 11 again and verse number 13. Romans 11, 13. He says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify in mine office, Paul says, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. So Paul's saying, I'm going to talk to you Gentiles for a moment, and what God's done here with this thing called the church and the Gentiles is he's trying to provoke his people, Israel, to jealousy and say, I want the, bless the spiritual blessings of God in Christ. He's, that's what he's trying to do with, the, with this, this uh, Gentile church. He says in verse 15, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the, from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is holy, and the root uh, be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafting in among them, the Jewish people in some manner, and with them partakest of the root of the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, Israel, take heed lest he spare not thee also. So it's a warning to the, to the Gentiles in the church not to look at themselves so highly and say, ha, we've replaced Israel. You say, no, no you haven't. You've just been grafted into this thing. And I did it really because of my people, Israel. I want to provoke them to jealousy. I want them to see what the spiritual blessings are in Christ. And I want them to say, ah, that's for me, my Messiah. So that's the reason he did it. But we've just been grafted in. We haven't replaced them. How do I know? Well, we read chapter 11, verse 25 and 26 already. He's showing, no, this is just in part this blindness. Until the Gentile church has been taken out of the way in the rapture. So, all of this... This promise, this prophecy, this history, all of this was done that he might fulfill the first promise he made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Does anyone remember Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That was the promise of the Messiah. So he's done all this in a way that only God can do to bring forth the one true spiritual seed. And that's how all the families of the earth can be blessed. And it has to begin with the church today because the church, Jew or Gentile, in the church, believer in Christ, as, a, as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ, we have that which brings the blessings to people, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Amen. period. Listen, let's face it, man, no matter what your age here today, 50, 60, 70 years, depending on if the Lord tarries and how old you are today, you're done with this life. You're done. Yeah. 
Amen. Thanks is right. You're done with this life. And so the blessings that we get are found only in the gospel. At the end of the day, if it doesn't end well for you, it doesn't end well. If it ends well in Christ, if you're accepted in the beloved, then it will end well. So he did all this. He made this promise. Look at Romans chapter number 4. Romans, cha Romans chapter 4. We're not going to go through much of it, but I want to show you a word that pops up over and over again. Um, now, in the first part of, of uh, Romans chapter 4, you can't miss it. It's about Abraham. Verse 1, what shall we say then? That Abraham, you know, then that Abraham our father has pertained to the flesh hath found. And he's talking about Abraham. But look down at verse number 13. I want to show you a word, and this is the word that I mentioned when I said this was a covenant of promise that God made. Look at the word in verse number 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Again, the law wasn't going to bring this thing, Exodus chapter 20. It was going to be the promise made in Genesis chapter 12 that was going to bring all this to fruition. Watch this, verse 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where, there, for where no law is, there is no transgression. What it's saying is, if you don't know, know it's wrong to do something, then it's not really wrong to you unless your conscience tells you it's wrong. That's what he's saying there. Verse 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So Abraham, this promise is given to Abraham, was remarkable. He's saying, look, I know the law was given specifically to the Jewish people. But there's something else that had gone on before that. It was the promise, and the promise is made available to everybody. That's what he's getting at here, and it was a covenant of promise which he gave. Now look over at Galatians chapter number 3. Over to the right a little bit, Galatians chapter number 3. See, your Bible is connected from front to end. Uh, you just have to understand the context and the way in which God is moving through history and the way he's moving through with different people groups, working with Israel, working with the church, working with Gentiles. You have to understand that and keep the context. While this is a spiritual book, and the Bible says here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, comparing spiritual with spiritual, that's how you keep yourself out of some trouble, it is still a book. It's meant to be read in context. You have to understand the context. It was still a book God gave it to us, a book that none of us can fathom completely, but a book nonetheless. Galatians chapter number 3, I want to show you a word that shows up again. Uh, maybe verse number 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Here's this guy again. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So again, God's saying, yes, there was this physical seed. Yes, I'm remembering Israel after the flesh. But there was something even more important that was the spiritual seed that was going to come. And it was going to come through the promise given to, Isaac, to, to Abraham through Isaac. Um, being made a, let's see, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive, there's the word, the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or added thereto. He's saying even a man can make a covenant and, and it should stick, but God's making this one, it really will stick. Brethren, oh, uh, verse 16. Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. Promises, plural, physical and spiritual. He, he saith not unto seeds as of many, but as one, and to thy seed, here it is, which is Christ. And this I say, verse 17, that the covenant that was confirmed, I'll read this verse, and you read it, and you go, what? And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Now you've got to go through that carefully. What he's saying here, and this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before in Christ, that's the promise. 
That goes back to Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 17, Genesis chapter 18, Genesis chapter 22, Genesis chapter 26, Genesis chapter 28. All that promise, he's saying, that promise, he's saying the law, see the, the commas, the law which came afterwards, the law which was 430 years after the promises were given, cannot disannul the promises. It did not take place, it did not take care of the, or it did not replace those promises. It did not make the promise of none effect, as he says here. The law was given, but why? For if the inheritance, verse 18, be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? What was the purpose? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels, and we don't have time to go through all this, in the hand of a mediator. Um, go down verse, well, let's read it. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Did this law which came 430 years after, we know it didn't disannul the promises, but is it, is it against it? God forbid, he says. In other words, no. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, Verily, righteousness should have come, have been by the law. He's saying, look, if there was a law ever given that could have brought life. Now, we know that the law was perfect, converting the soul. The promise or the problem was not with the law. The problem was with me. I could not keep the law. I can't keep the law. Nobody can keep the law but Jesus Christ perfectly. So he said, you know, if there was such a thing that could have, but, but there isn't because of us. But the scripture hath concluded... All under sin, that the promise, there's that word again, by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. By the way, notice it says that believe, it doesn't say them that are chosen. Does it? Over and over, we looked at this, this notion of election once upon a time, and, and if you're of a mindset that people are elected to, to salvation before the foundation of the world, then you read, you've already got a preconceived notion and you read all sorts of things in there. But this is pretty simple. He says, look, this promise was given to them that believe. And we know that whosoever will may come. So, in the last couple of minutes, I want to show you just a little bit more on this thing. And then I'll kind of summarize. Galatians chapter number 4, verse 19. Galatians 4, 19. Abraham shows up again. My little children, of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice. For I stand in doubt of you. Tell me that ye desire to be under the law. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it is written, here's this guy again, that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. There's that word again, promise and flesh. And they're compared and they're contrasted here. Which things are an allegory? I think that's the only time, yeah, it's the only time in Scripture that word shows up. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. That was the law given in Exodus 20. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in the allegory. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And answereth to Jerusalem, which now is. The physical, the temporal. So he's saying this thing of the law. I'm giving you an allegory. This thing of the law, which came out of the fleshy seed of Ishmael, all the way back there in Genesis, um, this allegory here, um, what he's saying is that gendereth to bondage. That's the thing which is the Jerusalem now. That's the temporal. But this other thing which is coming on the promise here, verse number 26, but Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. There it is again. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted. We don't need to go through any more of that. So, summarizing this here, and this is the last time we'll be talking about, we can go back to Genesis chapter number 12 with me. Last time we'll be talking about the covenant made here in any kind of detail. Genesis chapter 12. 
but it's important to remember this. God says here, he gives many promises to Abraham. It was a unilateral covenant, meaning both of them didn't say, well, you do this, I'll do that. You do this, I'll do that. You do this, I'll do that. Okay. No, it was God just saying, I will. I make a promise to you. And I promise it will be through your seed. It'll become out of your bowels, which he's going to later on confirm. And he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. He's going to be, there's going to be personal blessings. There's going to be national blessings. And there's going to be a land. And that's important for you and I to remember today because in your news media, remember, media, the media is the thing in between. And the news media, by and large, is the thing in between you and the truth. That's what it is today. By and large, that's what it is. And it isn't so much always in what they tell you, it's what they don't tell you. Both things, both things can confuse. But the news media today will tell you that what's gone on with the Jewish people in, in the Jewish land is wrong, and that land needs to be carved up, it needs to be taken away. It wasn't that many years ago when our president said, yeah, we need to go back to those pre-60, what was it, 67 or 68 borders. In other words, we need to take some more of the land away from Israel. Do you ever look at, you, you, you hear about the West Bank, the West Bank, the West Bank? Do you ever look at the West Bank on a map? It isn't just a little piece of land. It's a big piece of the land of Palestine. And Palestine has been given to the Jewish people. We saw in Genesis, um, we looked at it before, God marked it out. He said from the, from the river over there in the Nile in Egypt all the way to the great river, the river Euphrates, and then he marked out the northern part, and there's the Mediterranean Sea on the west side. So you get the idea of where that land is. And God said, it's the Jewish people. That's their land because it was mine first. I gave it to them, and it's an eternal promise. And so we need to remember that as Christians because we can sometimes get caught up in those, those kinds of things too and say, yeah, you know, why don't the Jewish people just give up a little bit more land? What are they doing in those occupied territories? You know what the occupied territories is? I thought for years, because I don't watch a lot of the news media. I watch a little bit. I always thought the occupied territories was, was the uh, so-called Palestinians, whatever those are. I don't even know. I'm not quite sure what a Palestinian is today, because... Arafat was an Egyptian, etc. But the Palestinians, I always thought it was them occupying Israel. No, when the news media says the, the occupied territory, they mean Israel occupying the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, which is their land. That's what they mean when they so you have to understand what they mean. So this topic of the of the um, of the covenant here is very relevant to the day and age in which we live because we have seen the national, not the spiritual, the natural, the physical, the temporal rebirth of Israel, the nation. Their spiritual rebirth is yet to come when that fullness of the Gentiles be come in. When the church is taken out of the way, God will deal with his people Israel. And at the end of that thing called the tribulation, they will say, my God and my Savior. They will recognize him for who he is. And all Israel by faith at that time will be saved. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the Bible says. Okay, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for uh, your word. Thank you that um, it's a prophetic word that you give to us. It's a progressive word. It kind of moves along, gives more details as we go along um, so that we can put our faith and trust in it and know that uh, when the Bible says, thus saith the Lord, you mean, thus saith the Lord, nothing else. Lord, help us by faith to walk in this covenant of promise that you've given to us, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that we might be faithful in getting the seed of the gospel, of the word of God, of Jesus Christ, and plant it into the hearts and minds of boys and girls coming up in VBS and men and women. Lord, help us in this thing that uh, you've given us to do. And by faith, we'll do the best we can. Lord, we love you and praise you. Thank you for joining with us today. Thank you for those who could be here. We pray for your service to come here in a little bit, that you would come and join with us in singing and in the Word of God, the ministry of the Word. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So glad to see you here. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Good to see you. Uh, as you know, we have some sad news, but, but really good news on the other side. 
Dave has passed away, okay, on, uh, he passed away yesterday at 10 in the morning, okay, but uh, I saw him on Friday, the deacons uh, visited him on uh, Wednesday, I saw him a few other times during the week, but uh, he was ready, it was, and I'm so glad God in his great mercy uh, took him then, uh, but he told me this before, he goes, I want to go home, I want to be with Jesus, so, uh, you know, the, there won't be no, uh, at this point, no funeral uh, or anything. There's going to be a memorial service in the future, okay? The family will get, let me know, okay? And so, uh, so, alrighty, let's take our songs, uh, uh, songbook, or if you would, it's on the PowerPoint, At the Cross, At the Cross, and we're going to sing about the cross of Christ, where I first saw the light. Let's all stand, if you would. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a work as I? Ready? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. You know what? It is sad that you're not going to see somebody for a little while, but we'll see him again, right? You know, there's a joy in my heart that we know Jesus Christ. And we can be with one another right now. Rejoice. Rejoice. You see Bob and Carol. Okay, we'll hear from her a little bit. Okay. And that you're here. Okay. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned up on the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. See now, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Verse 3. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's ready. Cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my son and now I am happy all the day. All right, last verse. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love my own. Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. Sing it now. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, you brought a joy that is unspeakable to our hearts. I just pray this day that, Lord, we'll rejoice because we know you. You'll speak to our hearts, Lord. Thank you for the great teaching this morning already. And, Lord, that we will become more like Jesus. And, Lord, we will know you even more as we leave this place. Bless us in your name. Amen. You may be seated at this point. Okay. We're going to sing one more hymn here before we have our announcements. Great Fanny Crosby. Every time I see Fanny Crosby, I mean, I, to, um, I'm just so touched by, you know, the story how a, a girl who was, went blind as, as a little infant because a doctor prescribed the wrong kind of, uh, actually a quack country doctor in the 1800s, early 1800s, put mustard, some, some kind of a mustard uh, solution or pad on her eyes and she went blind from that as a little baby uh, at six months old. And she became the greatest hymn writer. Uh, seeing Jesus, 
you know, though blind, seeing Jesus. And what a, this is about souls that we need to rescue. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We, or the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are sliding him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently, he will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Verse 4, rescue. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor, the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer, a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Beautiful song. Well, we want to welcome everyone here. Uh, did everyone get a copy of the bulletin? Please raise your hand if you didn't. Okay, we have one young lady right here. Two young ladies. Okay, Erica and Julie. Okay. And let me just stick this here. Okay. okay. Uh, everyone got a copy of our bulletin? Okay. <laughs> Well, we want to welcome Joy once again. Joy, good to see you. Okay. Uh, Jennifer's uh, mom. I could say Jennifer's sister. Wouldn't that be great? Can I do that? Anyway? Okay. All right. And uh, we want to welcome Tim. Tim, who came as a guest of um, Michael and Katie. Good to see you. God bless you. Okay. We're so glad you're here. Okay. And, of course, our sister Carol and Bob are here. And uh, we're going to hear from Carol in just a moment, just a few uh, um, uh, comments, whatever she wants to say. All right, if you notice here, we have Vacation Bible School starting this week. This is our shirt. This was designed by Sister Katie. Okay, she came up with that. Uh, and I'll tell you what, did you see the banner out there? That was the work of Zach and, and uh, Cindy Marshall. Okay, so we, uh, we got that all set. So we're excited. Listen, I, I know I'm ahead of myself. I want to thank God for the people that went out Saturday, last Saturday and this Saturday with uh, Mike, young Mike Rickard and Mary Rickard. And uh, we had uh, uh, Cindy Marshall, Brother Chris and myself. We went out nothing, you know. We got phone calls. We got 10 kids already coming just from the Sheridan Projects, okay? So I want to encourage you, you know, isn't that neat? Just spread the seed and get it out there. So that this is from um, August 1st. To the fifth every night at seven o'clock from seven to nine there'll be no uh bible study in the morning on thursday or at night it's all vbs this week okay so uh just so you know that invite children those that are workers your shirts are downstairs and next sunday uh regular service but at night we're going to have an awards night and i'd like to invite everyone from the church to come to that and that's where the kids are going to be uh actually showing you what they did the songs they learned uh, you know what, there'll be a, a slide presentation, uh, they'll get certificates, you know, and we, you know, just congratulate them on their being here, and then uh, hopefully their parents will be here, we'll have pizza and wings and just fellowship afterwards, but uh, we hope to, you know, that the parents that come, if they never heard the gospel, will hear the gospel for the first time, perhaps, so then they may be able to get saved, all right, but also I wanted you to say, I'll let you know this on Tuesday night, even though we're at VBS, Brother Keith Voss will be at Charity Baptist Church, uh, Charity Baptist Missions on Austin Street at 7 o'clock. If anybody wants to go and support and be there, he's there preaching. Uh, and if anybody wants to minister that way, that's available for you. Okay, now I'm going to take this over to Carol because uh, Carol's going to, we're good to see Carol, isn't it? Isn't it great? Uh, thank you, thank you. 
For those of you that don't know, I had a hip replacement, and I've been gone for two months, and I'm still trying to recoup, and I've got a few little issues going on, but I just want to thank everybody, first of all, for your prayers. And I'm probably going to cry because I get emotional when I hear think about this stuff, but, and your gifts and your cards. I got cards every day. The visits to the hospital and rehab and the beautiful flowers I received from so many people. And then I had the, the dinners that were brought to the house and the visitors and the phone calls. And, you know, but most of all, I want to thank God for this family of God. The compassion and the love that all of you showed was above and beyond. And, you know, my husband and I, we've gone to a lot of big churches due to our singing ministry. And this is the only church that I can honestly say showed the compassion and the love for a need. Like um, a small body of Christ did here at the church. We're blessed to be here. And, um, you know, we just praise God for every one of you. And thank you so much for, for getting me through this recovery. I appreciate that. But lastly, I just want to say one more thing. Bob has been my caretaker. And I know it's been a little rough on him because he's got his own health issues, but he did an awesome job. And I learned that he can do housework really great. <laughs> so he, he's, a, he's awesome. He stood by me. <laughs> but he, he, he's done a great job, and I praise God for all of you, and I praise God for a wonderful husband, and I praise the Lord for getting me through this difficult time. Thank you. Wow. Praise the Lord. And Carol, we have, you know, we missed you. We really did. You're greatly missed. Bob, we missed too, but we saw him somewhat, but we really missed you not being here. Okay. All righty. Well, a wonderful change took place when Jesus came into my heart. I hope it's, you can say the same. So we're going to turn to that in our song books. I believe it's number 35, or it'll also be on the PowerPoint. So let's stand one more time, okay? Oh, by the way, uh, you see the back table? Those aren't gifts for first-time visitors here. All those, all those toys and that, that's part of our just, you know, hey, bring some friends. You want to win a prize? Okay, it's just, you know, it really. But uh, we're going to have a lot of giveaway. We have great crafts. Great, we're going to have like an Olympic thing out here for the kids, uh, games and so forth. Good Bible teaching, lots of singing. And uh, uh, you, I hope you'll be able to come Sunday night and see it or even stop by during the week, okay? All right, Brother Mark, whenever we're ready here, okay? What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought Since Jesus came into my heart I have lied in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Much a joy o'er oh my soul Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I have ceased from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away. Thank you, God. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. My soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure, yes, since Jesus came into my heart. And no dark clouds of doubt now my pathway obscure since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart But your joy o'er oh my soul Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart Now we're going to sing uh, the last verse before we do. 
If you want to just say something that's just like this. Do you remember when Jesus came into your heart? Maybe you didn't know the exact day, the exact time. I says around this season and so forth. But on April 10th of 1975, in Duluth, Minnesota, with orders to go over to Guam, I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart, and he saved my soul. Anyone else, just by raising your hand, just want to say, do you remember that day or that time? Anyone? Go ahead. Just raise your hand. Okay, go ahead, Katie. All right. Wow. Praise the Lord. Beautiful. Someone else? Okay, go ahead, Sue. Wow. 2014. What a kid. Just a kid in Christ. Amen. So anybody else? Just a t- Here's a chance for you to be a witness. Okay, anyone? Just give me- Go ahead. Brother Jim. Wow. All right, brother. And if you don't know the exact day and time, it's okay. You know, go ahead, Mary. April 6, 20. Another baby. Okay. All right. Donna. Nineteen eighty four. Wow. Praise the Lord. Somebody else, you want to go ahead, Mary Rickard and then Jeanette. Wow, amen. Praise the Lord. Go ahead, Jeanette. Wow, amen. Wow. Anyone else? Yes, a chance. Hey, you know what? It's a lot of joy in just telling someone that Jesus is in your heart, huh? Hey, I miss Thursday night. Thursday. I yeah, can't wait to go out Thursday. A week from Thursday, we're going to go out on the streets again, singing downtown, passing tracks. Uh, you know what? And then the week after, that week also, we'll be uh, going out Saturday, putting out the door hangers. You know what? It's a chance to meet people. Just even if you just say, hi, how are you? You know, show the love of Jesus. Anybody else? Get a lot, last chance here. Mark, Mark Regaitis, go ahead. Wow, amen, brother. You old brother you are. Amen, I love it. Okay, go ahead. Yes, go ahead, Emma. Wow. 59. I was seven years old. Wow, okay, anyone else? We done? Everybody, we got one more. Hey, wasn't it good? It's good to hear in it, isn't it? Hope that encourages you. All right. I shall go there to dwell in that city I know Since Jesus came into my heart I'm happy, so happy as onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Much a joy o'er my soul Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart may be seated it's a beautiful thing and that's something it's a beautiful thing and you know what i just wanted to share this with everyone god wants you to know him in a personal way he wants you to have that relationship and you know what when, when, when you were saying all that you were encouraging me just hearing you know i know a lot of you could you know um can share that also and what an encouragement if we talk to one another and we find out when did that happen when did that take place and uh, when I think back, I'm, I'm, I says, God became so real on April 10th of 1975 when I, I knew Jesus was really there in the presence of my heart. Go through a lot of uh, trials and troubles, and there's a haven of rest the Bible speaks of. My soul in sad exile was out on life's seas So burdened with sin and distress Till I heard a sweet voice saying make me your choice And I entered the haven of I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail while seas no more. The 
tempest may sweep or the wild stormy keep in Jesus I'm safe evermore verse 3 you know you can imagine this person was no doubt on the seas you know of the physical seas and he wrote this song in the thought of how the Lord has been with them wow such a great song the song of my soul since the Lord made me whole has been the old story so blessed of those songs uh, you think about when you go through trials tri tribulations of life and those songs will come back the, the words will come back and uh, be a comfort to you uh, okay so just wanted to hope you're encouraged by the music and uh, Pastor Ron would you come up here you used to get yourself ready young fella he's a young fella isn't he Okay, so he's coming. We're going to have our ushers come also. Now, uh, what we're going to do is they're coming, fellas. Um, I will, we're going to take the faith promise pledge for those that are members or part of this church uh, at the end of the service. Okay, and I'll talk about that. But right now, we're just going to take our regular offering. The faith promise is not a physical offering you're putting in this Sunday. Nothing to do with that. So, okay, so I want to thank everyone for the gift and their giving. I got to say this, though. I wrote this down this morning. Give the Lord your best, not a bone. Okay, that was one that came to my head. But the other thing was this. It's this amazing thing in this place. Uh, we have faithful brothers and sisters, but then there's people on the outside. There's a person, uh, there's people that watch on the uh, live stream. A uh, person sent a check to the church, says, you bless me, I just want to you know, and be a blessing. So we want to thank God how God takes care of us. Go ahead, Brother Mike. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this time that we can come and hear your word, Lord God, without fear of persecution. We thank you for the safety in your arms, Lord God, and all that you do for us. We ask now that you bless the gift and the giver, bless the hearts that they would be giving of a free will, and uh, we just ask, Lord God, you bless your word today even more. Just uh, make it sweet. Good to see uh, folks like Carol back in the congregation. Just to ask you to continue to heal up all those who have afflictions. For Dave Hess's family, we ask that you comfort them and just pray somehow we might be a blessing to them. We ask now you bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Everyone.
it up for your gift and your giving. Go ahead, Pastor Ron. Okay, well, thank you. I, before I sing this song, I have to say, those little children down there, they're so special. But while I was sitting there, that little one kept looking back at me and my brother Kenny. And remind me, last Sunday, I, ba I dedicated a little baby. And one of the things I enjoy so much, and that is to dedicate a little baby, because they'll do three things. Number one, they'll look at you, they'll smile. Number two, they'll look at you and they'll cry. And number three, they'll look at you and stare like she did to my brother and I, and stare and stare, and all of a sudden she smile. They're so special. And you are too, pal, my little buddy over there. But I don't see Heidi. Now, Heidi told me she wanted me to sing the song for her today. She's not here, so I'm going to have to sing it to you all. But the, the second one i got to tell you ahead of time, make sure that you have a hanky on you because you're going to cry. But it's okay to cry. Jesus cried, and you need to clean your ears. So I hope I get through it myself. Now, when my brother and I was young, little boys, my dad said we not supposed to cry. And I never cried until the day I got saved. 1963, by the way, in Bible Baptist Church, 1963. And, and that was the day I cried. Old Niagara Falls opened up. And my wife always said, ever since then, what a crybaby I am. And I am. <laughs> Pastor Al brought a couple of videos a few weeks ago. And, and no one saw me, I hope, because it was hard. I would vote the, on, on the service, soldiers. But anyway, I don't see Heidi, but this one here, I'm just going to sing two verses and then get into the teardropper song, if I can do it. But anyway, life's where way to heaven. And there's something about that if you listen to it, because we all go through that. Hills, valleys, and even when we don't think God's there, but he's there. And that is uh, life. Well, I don't know what happened to Heidi, but tell her I sung it. Anyway. Life is like... A mountain railroad with an engineer that brave. We must make the run successful from the cradle to the grave. Watch the curve, the hills and tunnels never fall or never fail. Keep your hand. Upon the throttle and your eyes upon the rail. Blessed Savior, thou will guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in God praise forevermore. You will roll the praise of trial. You will cross the bridge of strife. See that Christ is your conductor on this lightning train of life. Always mindful of obstruction. Do your duty, never fail. Keep your hand on the throttle and your eyes upon the rail. Blessed Savior, Thou will guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in God praise forevermore. Now, <laughs> something happened to me a little while ago, three days ago, had to celebrate my wife's going home be with the Lord. It was three days ago. And it uh, never happened before. Uh, in the middle of the night, I had a dream. It was weird. But the dream was I was crying my head off. And sometimes that happens. You know, you, we've been together for 58 years. But anyway, in a dream, I was crying. And a whole lot of people, I think it was you guys. I don't know who it was. But, but I, I, I was saying, why are you all here? Why are you all here? I, did you know that this was going to happen? I don't know who it was. But the thing about was, after I woke up, I couldn't get over that. I went out, and of course, I'm going through all my cassettes. All these years, I'm putting them on CDs and DVDs and stuff like that. And the first one I grabbed, it, it, the, the date was, it really gave me the goosebump. The date was July the 27th. She died July 28th. July 28th, 27th, 2008. And it was exactly the message I preached on, exactly what I needed. I needed it. But anyway, uh, it's, it, it's interesting. But I, I, the Lord laid on my heart because three days ago is when I celebrated. But anyway, uh, the night before, 
she passed away. I'll never forget that. Uh, they, they say she only had a few hours to live. And I'm saying to myself, how could this be? It's hard to believe that after 58 years. How can that be? But anyway, make a long story short, I remember sitting there from 8.30 at night till 4.30 in the morning holding her hand and uh, crying. <laughs> I cried. I really cried it out. And um, she's holding my hand tight. And at 4.30 in the morning, she began, all of a sudden, the moaning stopped. And, and she passed on. I looked at the clock. It was 4.30. It's weird because the clock is still in my front room and it's, it's still 4.30. It hasn't moved. I, I don't understand, but it's still 4. I won't touch it, but it's 4.30. But anyway, she came home for about a week before she passed away. And uh, I'll never forget it because I would go over to her hospital bed in there, that big window, and she said, Honey, she said, I'm so glad that you brought me home. She said, I love looking out this window. I love being home. And just a few days later, she was gone. But this song here, it's a song here that's, it's, uh, I, I love it. And the reason I do is it's from Alan Jackson. He's a born-again Christian country singer, Alan Jackson. And him and his wife said that when the day comes, they listened to that song, they wanted this song to be played at their funeral. Elaine and I both said, hey, they, I love that song. We're going to have that played at our song. And little did I realize it was to her. But this song here, <laughs> and I'm going to try, I'm going to make it, don't worry. I'm going to make it, and Carol, you just hang in there. And I know it's not easy. But listen to the words to it, and I'll be all done. If I survey all the good things that come to me from above, if I count all the blessings from the storehouse of love, I simply ask for the favor of him beyond mortal king. And I'm sure that he granted again. I want to scroll over heaven with you some glad day. When all the troubles and heartaches are finished away, then we'll enjoy beauty where all things are new. I want to scroll over heaven with you. So many places of beauty we long to see here below. The time of treasure that keep us from making plans as you know. But come the morning of the rapture, together we'll stand anew while I stroll over heaven with you. I want to scroll over heaven with you some glad day when all the troubles and heartaches are vanished away. Then we'll enjoy the beauty where all things are new. I want to scroll over heaven with you. I want to scroll over heaven with you. Amen. Amen. That little sweetie pie. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Ron. Wow, that was great. Stroll over heaven with you. Okay. Zach, you may be dismissed. Are any children with would like to go with Brother Jim? Okay. And uh, I think Jennifer, you got the nursery, but that's okay. You, you know what you're doing there, okay? If you guys want to stay, you can stay there with I understand that too. Okay, let's take our Bibles and turn to um, Matthew, Matthew chapter 14. Okay, Matthew 14. As I said, we had what a great teaching in Genesis 12. Uh, uh, if you were not familiar with the Abraham covenant, boy, it's pretty clear in understanding the times we live in. But uh, we're going to look in John, uh, Matthew chapter 14. The name of the sermon is The Other Side, okay? The Other Side. And 
the other side. Matthew 14, 22, and straightway. You know, I like about the, the King James, it challenges me to uh, expand my vocabulary. Straightway is, another word is immediately, no delay without, you know, uh, not delay or, or loss of time. So this is urgent. Straightway, right away, Jesus constrained. And, he kinda, and, and another word there, to constrain means the press, an urge. So he constrained his disciples to get into a ship. He was really like, get into the ship. Why? Was he, why, why was he doing this? We're going to talk about it. And to go before him to the other, unto the other side. That's where we're getting our text from. While he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up unto a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, if, I'm sorry, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the water, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. You know, that's the only man I know that ever has walked on the water outside of Jesus, who was God and man, okay? When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. They were, they were privileged in seeing so many miracles. Let me just say something. How many miracles and blessings have you seen and still we doubt? Still we forget. Okay, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about when the Lord takes you to the other side. When the Lord takes you to the other side of things. Now, we, we had seen uh, from before Jesus' ministry from last week, okay, uh, that he was down here and they came back up here in Capernaum. Now, this is... The, the feeding of the 5,000 preceded the walking on the, the water. Okay, so what they did was actually just took a, he told them to get in their boats and he went from here to here. Wasn't that long a trip. So from Capernaum to uh, Genezareth. Okay, so while they were doing that, uh, the, uh, Jesus went one way and he sent the apostles. He says, go to the other side. All right, and... Uh, See, what was going on, if you, as you looked at that, was great popularity. I mean, can you imagine, would you like to be at some place and say, this is, what's going on? How, come, how is everybody being fed here? So the little, the little boy had uh, five loaves and two fishes. And you know what? And I'm sure that people say, I want to follow this guy. And the crowd, we know from John chapter 6, wanted to make Jesus king. No, he didn't. Jesus went alone to pray, and he sent the apostles to the, to the other side. So let's take a look at this now, uh, the other side. And you know what? We need to see the other side of things, don't we? Think about this. If you always see one side all the time of your life and your faith is never challenged, that's what I'm talking about. If your faith is never challenged to change and to get more, more like Christ, you'll never understand things. Sometimes Jesus will take you to the other, other side. Things are going great. They, can you imagine it being a, you know, uh, one of the apostles and they're going, I'm with him. Yeah, the guy that just fed you. Yeah, I'm with him. Isn't it great? I'm with him. And, you know, and Jesus did not want them to make him king. That wasn't the time, okay? But he said, go to the other side, and he's going to teach them a valuable lesson even more. And let me just say this. That's why we go through things. That's why we sometimes, they go, why am I going, why am I over here right now? Because the Lord is trying to teach us something to strengthen our faith. And this is what this is all about, the other side, okay? Things that happen, we can learn on the other side. Now, let's take a look at this. Back in, in Matthew chapter 14, once again, verse 22, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him 
unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now, he took care of the crowd. He goes, look, I don't know what he said. He just said, you boys get in a boat and go. And he took care of the crowd. All right. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. That's, so on the other let's, we need to see the other side of prayer. How's your prayer life? I mean, you know, you have a set way of praying, this and that, but sometimes God takes you to the other side where your prayers become more intense, more fervent, more crying out to God, you know, where God wants to change and challenge you in your faith. And if you look in verse 24, he, he says, verse 23 at the end, when the evening was come, he was alone, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. The wind that was with them now is against them. Did you ever go to the other side? There are people that were with you, and now they're not with you anymore. You know, go through all kinds of things in life, right? Okay, but here's the key thing. Jesus is up in a mountain. It's kind of a picture, a prophetic picture of his present position. He's in heaven right now, okay? What's he doing in heaven? He's praying for us. Can you imagine that? That Jesus is praying for you? He's interceding for you? Isn't that great? Okay, and you know, he's praying for you, and you know what? We're left on this troubled, trialed world, tested world, right? Things, you know, all of a sudden, things are going fine. It was, we used to say in the Air Force, I was walking around fat, dumb, and happy, and all of a sudden, boom, something happens, you know, and something changes. And they're down there. Okay, but listen, Jesus is going to come down from the mountain one day. Amen. He's going to come from glory one day to this troubled world, this tribulated world, this tribulation our brother talked about er, uh, in, in the teaching today. And Jesus will take care of all things, my friends. So the other side of this, let's take a look at this for a minute. He's alone praying. Okay, what's, what's he doing? He'd rather have communion with his father than hang with the multitude. Because I don't know, do you ever notice the more you talk with a lot of people, your mind starts going, <whistles> things spin, and he gets alone with God. He gets alone with his father. And there's the other side, my friends. He wants to get as far away from the world and the crowd and be alone with his Father. I want to encourage you. That's the other side. I hope you and I come to an other side of prayer. I hope that your prayer life becomes so much greater and, and better. But let me just say this. Do you ever go, where's Jesus? He's there. He's, he's praying for it. He knows the storm's coming. Let me just say this. He never gets like, Lord, this just happened to me. Oh, my gosh, where are you? Jesus never says from heaven, well, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> Father, what do you think about that? Can, I believe, can you believe that? No. He knows. He's praying for us to strengthen us. So let's get to the other side of prayer. His eye is always upon you. Remember the song? His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. Wow. You know what it means by his eye is on the sparrow? There's 960 some species of sparrow. Multiply the 960 different, it means different types of sparrows. You multiply, there's billions and billions. And he says, I know when one falls to the ground. Isn't that something? That he cares. So the other side. Now we're going to see Jesus walking now. We see him praying. The other side of walking. Let me see, how's your walking right now? Are you walking on the sea? <laughs> You're looking at me. I, I, you know, are you being overcome by problems? Look in verse 25. And in the fourth watch, you know what the fourth watch of the night is? It's the darkest hour. It's the time between midnight going into 3 o'clock and on. It's called the fourth watch. And it's dark. Isn't it sometimes at the darkest hour? You know what? We, that's when you're going to realize how much Jesus cares. And he loves you, friends. And it says, he was in the fourth watch, uh, watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. Know what that meant? They thought it was a ghost and, and, and a spirit that way because the Jews had a, um, you know, we have all kinds of what, uh, what's not the word tradition, uh, things we make up, or I'm trying to think of the word. I can't think of it right now. We have all kinds of these things that come up and, you know, like someone said, this is dumb, right? If you drop, what? You drop a fork or a spoon and three people are coming off. What do you call it? Superstitions. Thank you. Okay. And the Jews believed that. They had this belief that if, you know what? That if they saw a premonition or they saw somebody, there, somebody's going to die. They're going to die, you know? So this is their worst. They say, they figure like, oh my goodness. Look, you guys see what I see? We're going to die. But the Bible says, but straightway. 
Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, he says. Be of good cheer, it is I. You know what? It is I. When the I am is in your life, boy, he says, be not afraid. We still have trouble with this. We still have trouble trusting the Lord. After all this time, don't we? We still have this trouble. And you know what? So I'm glad this is here in the Bible because there's 12 guys that just saw him feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. And prior to that, he's, he's taken Peter's mother-in-law by the hand. He's cast out demonic spirits out of people. You know, we've seen him preaching and healing and doing all these wonderful things, my friends, and still got trouble. You know, this is kind of neat. You're in all this trouble. Here comes, you're like this, Lord, Lord, Lord. Here's Jesus walking on the water, smooth, like a smooth carpet. He's got his eye on you. He's not going to let you sink. You know, he's a God of great grace. He's, listen, this person said this. He's willing to enter into your struggle at the time of darkness. He's longing to. Did you know that? You're not alone. He doesn't want you to be alone that way, my friends. And you know, the storms of life will come, don't they? Don't they come out of nowhere? You ever get caught in a storm out of nowhere? Wow, you know what? That came out of nowhere. Storms like this, you know what? All you got to, just check your, 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 your mailbox or, you know, or your, your, what, your answer machine when you get home. You, may, you don't ever know what's in there, right? What problems may come. But turn with me to Psalm 93. I want to talk about just some storms for a minute. I remember this scripture from a guy in uh, Bible school, uh, which is many years ago now. Oh, my goodness. 40, almost like 40, 39, 40 years ago. Catches up to us, don't it? Aren't you glad you know Jesus? Aren't you glad, you know, because on the other side, there's, there's, an, there's an other side of our walk. Our walk needs to become a walk of faith. Our prayer needs to be, you know, intense into the Lord and trusting God. But in Psalm 93, look in verse 1. I hope that, you know what, if you, when you go through storms, remember this scripture. The Lord reigns right there. Who's reigning? He is. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Not only is he majestic, he's your strength. Wherewith he hath girded himself. Girding is like, you know, you put your belt on and so forth. The world is also established and it cannot be moved. He's in charge of everything. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. He always was. He always is. By the way, I'm preaching to myself. When I have my little problems, the Lord could say, Al, you're no different than so-and-so from the 18th century and the 17th. I took care of it. I'm going to take care of you. I know what you're going through. But here's what happens. The floods have lifted up, O oh Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. Is that happening to you? The voices of the flood hitting you like, you know, like just wave after wave crashing against your boat, crashing against you and just say, now what? Oh, and these voices, are, what? I'm sure you've gone through it. When's this going to stop? Am I ever going to be truly healed? Uh, you know, what's going on now? What's wrong? You know, why now this? And you know what? And he says this. The floods have lifted up, O oh Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their way. I'm going to be engulfed. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise. Did you get this one? The Lord on high is mightier than the, what do you say? Noise. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise because that's what it is. It's the noise that comes into our life and scares the bejeebers out of us. Uh, he says, The noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea, that thy testimonies are very sure. He's talking about the word of God. You, this is, he's going to be with you. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Now storms will come. They will come upon us. All right? And what happens here is this. You know, we see... As we go back in this, in, into Matthew now, if you would turn back there, his desire is to quench our fears. That's what he wants. You're on the other side. I said, I've never been on this side of this before. But God says, I, I want to do something in your life. See, it looked good. Just, oh, everything of 5,000 fed. This is beautiful. Look what I got. 
Now we're, we're going to die? What's going on? The Lord says, I'm with you. We're going to get through this. That's why Jesus said in, in 1427 of Matthew, but straightway Jesus spake unto them. He will, you know what that straightway, remember I said, immediately, without delay, he will speak to you. But you know what's happening? The noise is in our ears. The waves and everything, we're listening, we're the opinions of man. That's why he got alone. That's why you need to get alone with God. And all of a sudden, oh, I love the scripture, Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. See, in the stillness, we, we calm down. Because, you know, I don't care what. Are you like me? When I hear all these noises, I'm trying to figure out what to do. Well, I'll do this over here. Well, what happened? I'll do this here. I'll do this here. And I'm like, but all of a sudden, I'm like, I need a break. You know, you know, and it happens to us. It happens to us. Well, friends, let's go on with this. I just want to show you something. He's always been there. There's another great song. He's been there all the time. He's been there all the time. He's there all the time. And friends, I want to say this. He's, he was there with them before this incident. Look, just keep your finger right there. Go to Matthew 8. I think our brother uh, preached this. Brother Ed preached this a year ago or so. Or, uh, I don't know if it was out of Matthew or it was Mark. But uh, when G, remember when uh, the, uh, Jesus is, is asleep in the boat? And the disciples say, we're going to die. You know, here they go again, you know. You know, it's funny. I love those, the apostles. There were people just like you and I. And how many times I'm going like this, I, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. No way. I'm not going to make it. And I, did you ever do this? I got all these bailout plans. Okay. If this time I can do this. If that happens, I'll do that. You know, the Lord says, what are you doing? You're not trusting me. In Matthew 8, 26, he tells the apostles as they cry out that they're going to perish. And he saith unto them, why are you so fearful, o you of little faith? And he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. He did it before. Oh, come on. He's done it before. Sometimes he takes us to the other side because we forgot that. How he has provided and taken care of us and done these great and mighty things. All right, let's go on back into Matthew chapter 14 now. Uh, on the other side of prayer, the other side of our walk, and the other side of how Jesus will answer us. I love this. In Matthew 14, verse 28, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Did you ever hear the scripture? Call unto me, and I will answer thee. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. The Lord says, you call to me, I'm going to show you things you've never known. Maybe you're going through things, there's things yet to come where God's going to show his greatness in such an un unbelievable way. But Jeremiah 33 is a great scripture, and I preached that years ago. That's God's phone number. When in doubt or when in dial Jeremiah 333, okay? When in need, dial Jeremiah 333. I got a problem? Dial Jeremiah 333. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Peter is going to walk on a water. He's taken to the other side. He's going to do something he's never done before. When's the last time, a good thing in the Lord, that you've done something you've never done before for Jesus? You saw something like you've never seen before. Didn't he say to them, he says, you'll do greater things than I do because I go to my Father. And you know what? That's why Jesus takes us to the other side a lot of times. And friends, as he takes us to the other side, I mean, I think I've got the script, not the, let's see if I got it here. Oh, what I do now? Oh, there we go. Okay. Jesus is bidding Peter. Uh, you know what? I, I can picture, this is me. I'll show you where I'm at. <laughs> Hanging on to the pole, the mast. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not being like, don't hang on to me. <laughs> Every man for himself. Okay. Now, friends, but listen. Now I'm going to get into the nitty-gritty of this real quick, okay? To walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. You can't stay in that boat. 
that God is going to take you to a place where he wants to change and challenge you. Can you imagine Peter at the time, the fear, what he went through? Can you imagine Peter, after this was done years later, can you imagine him talking to a congregation of people? He goes, I actually walked on the water. I mean, I, Jesus, I'm telling you, who he, can you imagine how that must encourage people? He went to the other side, he says, and he might be saying, don't fear Rome, don't fear the persecution, don't fear all, you know, uh, the emperor and the lions and the persecutions and the crucifixion. He said, I walked on the water, and when I took my eyes off him, I slipped and he caught me. And you know, how encouraging. So sometimes what you go through while you're going through, there's another side, you're going to help somebody else someday in a great and mighty way, a way you've never helped people before, my friends. So we got to get out of that boat. You know what I find in this boat? I don't know what's uh, uh, in your boat, but uh, here's what's in my boat, self, Mr. Self. Mr. I, you know what? That's Mr. Self. It's got to die. You've got to get out of that. You know what? I, do you think, I don't want to do what I'm supposed to do. He said, oh, you're such a man of God. I'd rather be home sleeping. I'd rather be playing with my trains. You know what? I'd be doing anything under the sun. But you go, Thursday, if we go out and we go on the street, my flesh goes, I don't want to do this. Even, you know, like push, uh, putting uh, uh, the hangers on the door, I don't want to do this. Even we went out with, a, you know, uh, Saturday, yesterday, you know, I don't want to do this. No, let somebody else do it. Like this, I'm going to go, you're the pastor, you sit back there and do nothing, let everybody else do it. You know, and friends, my flesh doesn't want it. But there's fear in me. Maybe there's fear in your boat. You're, you're, you're afraid. You're afraid. Maybe it's just, you know, you're set in your ways. You're stubborn. You're cold-hearted. You're opinionated. You're, you're so much. You know what? Listen, he allows the storm because, you know what? He wants to help you grow and proceed and advance in a faith like you've never had. I think he wants to do that with this church. I really do. And I'm really getting, I'm getting excited. I'm getting excited about, you know what, people's hearts and wanting to do something. Not just because of VBS, just wanting to, what, get the gospel out. You just don't sit there and say, here we are. you got to go go out there where they are, okay? Friends, let me ask you something. Which is, which is uh, your, your situation? Are you living by faith or fear? Which one? If you don't get out of the boat, you'll never walk on the water. You know what? And there's challenges. It might be in your giving. It might be in your serving. It might be in, in living for others, okay? But I, I don't know. But I'll tell you what. There was a man named William Carey. How many ever heard of William Carey? Now, I, you can't, I'm sorry. That's a little bit, uh, I, I wish I had a better one of that. He said, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Who was he? William Carey? He was the father of modern missions. In the 1800s, he was a shoe cobbler in uh, Great Britain. And what happened was he got called by God. He was the first guy to say, Let's, I want to go into a mission field. I want to carry the gospel. And God laid his heart to go to India. And you know what? There, you know what? He didn't have supporting churches like, you know, he was the first one that brought all this out about missions. And he says, we need to get the gospel from here out into the, out into the known world. Uh, and he did. He went by faith. He had some people personally helping him. He had a little mission board helping him. And that was the beginning of it as, as it grew. He went to India, and for five years, nobody got saved. Five years in India. Can you imagine that? He was ready to give up. Five years. And then after that, friends, after, something broke after the five, fifth year. Kind of like the word grace, don't you? Okay, what happened is at, at the end of his life, there was 127 churches established with the gospel of Jesus Christ in India. He translated, there's so many dialects in, in India. It's, he, di he translated the Bible in, th in the 35 different dialects and the innumerable souls that were saved. Friends, if you just get out of the boat, and I just want to thank those for helping me get out of the boat for all your encouragement and strength. And just us when we went out yesterday, Nobody. I mean, I didn't get any good response. Just I talked every now and then with someone. Hi, how are you? You know, so I'm walking down. It's hot. And I'm watching. Everybody's out there, you know. And I, here's what's going through my mind. Oh, how sweet to walk round and round the block. You know, tell. What's it? What's it say? Wait. Oh, how sweet to walk round and round the block. 
What's it? Ringing doorbells for my Lord, wearing out my shoes, telling God's good news, ringing doorbells for my Lord. And I'm going down the list by myself. Ding dong, ding dong, ring. No wonder nobody wanted to talk to me. He go, watch the little ball guy. Hey, little kid, you want to come to church? Ah! You know, so we went back in the car. I came home and go, ah, you know. We, I says, you know what? As my wife said, we says, remember when, you, when we do something and we don't see any results, God does it, you know? He'll bring him in. Almost like I came back to church uh, a little while later and there was three phone calls. Boom, boom, boom. Can we come to church? Is it okay if we bring more than two people? I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, it's all right. I'm like, wow. And I'm just trying to say is this, you got to get out of the boat. You got to get out of the boat and, and you got to activate that Christianity. How great that is, my friends. How great that is. But let's see very quickly here. Jesus now, back in Matthew 14, verse 30. When Peter saw the wind, it was boisterous, wasn't it? He was afraid. He began to sink and he cried, Lord, save me. I always like that picture. Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And he says to him, Why did you doubt? He said, And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Let me just say this very quickly. Jesus saves. We, we raised our hands today and Jesus saved us. How many times has Jesus saved us from our troubles and trials? He saved my soul, didn't he? Look at Matthew 18, verse 21 for a minute. Matthew 18, 21. And I just want to say this. Oh, I'm sorry. Matthew 18, 11. Sorry. Matthew 18, 11. This is what Jesus said. Matthew 18, 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Isn't that great? You know? You got there, brother? Is come to save that one. Okay. That's, that's Luke you're thinking about. Matthew 18, 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Let me just say this. You hear me, if you think I'm harping all the time, that's because I'm an angel. Okay, now, that Bible you have is God's perfect word. And I'm not going to attack other churches. That's not what that, you know. But these, there are people that are out today just tearing down the King James and the word of God you hold. Do you know that verse isn't in their Bibles? Did you know that? There, that's a footnote in a Bible. So it, under, it says, not found in the original or the better, which is a bunch of crow's feet, okay? And friends, they don't know what they're talking about. It's out. And what I'm trying to say is this. All I'm trying to say is this. Don't take the precious word of God and cause people to doubt. And cause people to doubt. Is this word good? Is it perfect? What's right? Which is, you know what? That's all this has done. And it's been for this. And there's another reason. You can, every new version, it's money for the printers. Okay? Now, I'm going to stop there, okay? Because that's not what I want to talk about. But I want to go that Jesus saves. And I'm glad that verse is in the B-I-B-L-E that I hold, the King James 1611. All right, the Bible that we have, it's not a footnote, it's there. And Jesus is the one who not only saves the soul, but back in Matthew 14, Jesus, as soon as Peter cries out. And there's another side, isn't it? There's, there, you know what? Sometimes God takes us to the other side. We cry out, oh God, I'm so sorry. I've sinned this way. Forgive me. Get me from this. And he takes you immediately by the hand. He caught him. He caught him. He caught him. And friends, before he knew it, he wasn't sinking anymore. He was in the ship with Jesus. It's amazing, isn't it? Just a couple more things, friends. Now I want to show you this. Look in Matthew 14, 31. So on the other side, Jesus, there's another side that he takes us into prayer. Another side about our walking. Another side about how he answers us. And now you understand better. Uh, the other side of salvation. Yeah, he takes you sometimes. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, he's trying to get you to the other side. He's trying to see, and this is what the Bible says, come now and let us reason together. See, we're, we, you know, the Lord wants to reason with a very unreasonable people we are. Boy, are we unreasonable. You know, here's what, this is my reason. You mean if I accept you like this, then I got to stop this. I can't do this. I can't have no fun. All my fun was a bunch of dirty garbage. That's all it was. That all it was. That's all it was. Now, friends, I'll tell you what. In Matthew 14, we look at verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? 
If you get anything out of this, I hope you get this. God wants to take you to the other side of your faith. There are people who have no faith. Mark 4.40 says that. Jesus says, where's your faith? You know, what? you know why? Because you're dominated by fear. Are you dominated by fear? Do you know what fear keeps you from accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you know religion, religion can put you into a false mode of confidence? And, you know, whether it's Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Evangelical, Baptist, I don't care what it is. You know what, if they say, oh, I'm this, I'm that. You know what, God's not impressed with that. It's not, it's not what he's talking about. You know what, I, had, I know because I held on to a religion instead of finding a relationship of Jesus Christ. I know Jesus Christ now. I, I'm saved. I know it. But the fear kept me from it. Then there's another one. Jesus says, little faith. Because they doubted. How much? Is my faith that small? Uh, that God that has been that big, that has taken care of me and you through all my life, is, God, is, is, my, is my faith? You know, doubt causes you to be a person of little faith. Then there's faith in Mark 11, 22 through 23. Because of time, I'm not going to go there with you. But in essence, he says, have faith in God. And he says, if you say unto that mountain or that tree, he says, but he says, and you believe you believe, belief. Where does, where does my faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word, the word of God. Jesus says without faith, it's impossible to please them. Do you know how, how, many, how many are frustrated with pleasing people? How many says, I had enough of this? You know what? I, you know, he, <laughs> just joking, joking, joking. <laughs> she didn't see you raise your hand. Oh, I didn't say it. Okay. But you know what? When you think about this, listen, you know what? Uh, I'm tired of pleasing people and doing things just, Please God. But how do you please God? Faith. Faith. Jesus says, faith without works is dead. Faith has got to be activated. You know, a simple thing of just passing out some flyers in the name of Jesus Christ. A little, just something little insignificant as that. You know, just got out of our comfort zone, went out, and we did that. And there's greater things we can do and yet to be done in Jesus Christ, friends. And um, because faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Then there's the great faith. The woman, remember this woman? She, she had a daughter and she wanted to get him healed. She went and the apostle said, get it, get it, wait, you know, you're a Gentile, you know, and, he, and, and she cries out and, and uh, Jesus said, well, listen, I've come for the children of Israel. She goes, and she says, yeah, but you know what? I'll, I, you know, he says, I can't give, I forgot what he says, something about the dogs. And she says, but yes, he goes, even the dogs would take the crumbs. When he saw that, when he heard that, your friends, you know what great faith is? Because your faith is based on his person of mercy. He's never going to let you down. Mercy. And he said to us, you got so great faith there. He healed, okay, her, uh, friends, and that's what he said. But then there's the so great faith, the ultimate. Who's that? The centurion ser uh, uh, servant. Remember that? He said, Lord, I'm not worthy to come under your roof. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus marveled. Here's a Roman centurion, and here's all his, the Jewish priests, scribes, Pharisees, all the religious people, and here's a Roman soldier who comes out of the emperor worship, and he says, all you got to do is say the word, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, I have not found so great faith in all Israel. I don't know where you at are at, but I'd like to be on that one, wouldn't you? I, what, can I admit to you? I'm not. Don't get mad. Don't get sad. I'm not. I'm going through a process. You know what? I, I don't know exactly where I am, but I kind of fluctuate like the stock market somewhere in here, you know? Okay? And I, you know, I want to grow stronger in Christ. He says, you're not a man of faith. Yes, I am. I trust the Lord, but I, I, I need at times... To go to the other side where I don't want to go and have God test my faith and strengthen it. And finally, my friends, okay, let's go to Matthew 14, 33. So Jesus takes us there to test and show our faith. And then finally, look what happens. Verse 33, then they which were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying of a truth, thou art the son of God. You know what? Why did you notice when you were before you were saved, you didn't really talk bold about Jesus? 
as the religion I was in, I would talk about God. And, but when I said Jesus, because I was taught that, and I understand it, Jesus, Jesus. It's always like a reverence, which was great, but it wasn't proclaiming. Then I got around some of these people go, yep, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> wow. I don't talk like that. I've been around people that swore at that beautiful name. Been enough around them. But you know what? Then I found myself growing more and more. And I think I go, and now was it Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to try it sometime, really. Come out some Thursday, and we start singing. And I'll, we'll stop every blue moon, and I'll just say a few words. But I mean, for me, it says, the Lord Jesus Christ will save you. Right here in downtown Buffalo. You know, trains, things going back and forth. And just saying that, you're going, you know what? It does something to your faith. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I know that means when he's the Son of God that he is 100% man, 100% God. He's the Savior. As my brother talked this morning, he's the promise. He's the seed and has come to being, friends. And this is what he said of a truth. That's the result. Now, this is it. The other side, that's the whole reason for this. So that they would say, you are everything who you said you are. And you remember, they, it was easy for them. Did you know they said that after the feeding of the 5,000? Look at this. Turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. You got to see this. Boy, of all verses, John 6, 66. Doesn't sound weird? Okay. John 6, 66. Jesus told the people after they had experienced, he says, unless you eat me, take me in your life, he says, you will never have eternal life. They're like, whoa, what are you, no, crazy? He says, I'm the bread of life. He didn't mean physically. He meant take him into the, your heart. And he never caught that. And it says this, John 6, 6, 6, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. See, they needed to go to the other side. They didn't. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Watch what he says. Thou hast the words of eternal life. And this is what Peter said. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. <laughs> Hours later, I'm sinking, Lord, save me. And at the end result, they said, You are the Son of God. It was only a couple, uh, a little while later, Jesus says, whom do men say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. What I'm trying to say to you is this, to the other side, God is trying to strengthen your faith so you will be confident. So you will show people, when you're confident, you look at, and you're talking to somebody like this, I believe in Jesus Christ. I know he's real, he saved my soul. I know you're looking at me like going, yeah, that guy's nuts, or he really believes it. It'd be awful if I go like this. Well, I don't know, Jesus, you know, I guess. I, I think he is. Well, you know, it could be. You know, what do you think? Do you think he is? How about you? You look a little bit smarter than me. How about you? You guys say, you know, I mean, that doesn't do anything but to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. He's my Lord and Savior. He is the Son of God. So that's why they went to the other side. And friends, I'll tell you as we finish with this now. It's worth it knowing Jesus Christ. And let every trial come. Go ahead. Let it come. That I would become more like Jesus and more vocal from the heart of love to declare who he is. Because I'll tell you what. When I saw Dave Hess, and I know the guys saw him, uh, the deacons, and, and you guys saw the shape he was in. This was the worst he was in that I saw. He was sitting up, and he was hit like this over at the, the pillow. And I could see he was in such, you know, and I tried to talk with him the best I can. But, you know, we had talked, fortunately, uh, a week before, and I talked, you know, he was ready. You know what? Uh, he, he knew Christ as his Savior. And you know what? I'm thinking like this. He was ready to go to the other side. He was ready now. He says, you know what? The outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed. And friends, that's where Jesus wants to take you so that, friends, when that storm of life comes, and I hate this thought. I always hate, I get this stupid thought of laying on that hospital thing in an emergency room, looking at that light. I've been there many times with people. 
on a pain, what is your pain ratio on from one to 10? You know, I said like, you know, there's people running around, beep, beep, shh, I'm having a phone for, you know, they're saying all kinds of stuff and you're there. Oh, you got time to say, well, it's time I got close to Jesus Christ and I think it's about time I just really walk with God. Now is the time. Now. So let those things happen now. So when that day comes, I'll just go, so come now, Lord Jesus. So come now. I'm ready to see you. Get out of that boat and walk on that water. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Mary. Uh, from some of the things he maybe did wrong because none of us are perfect yet on this side of eternity. Yeah, exactly. Genesis chapter number 12, verse uh, number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, this later would become Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth.